My name is Blair Smith, and I am a senior director here at the Center for Financial Markets for the Milken Institute. And I have the privilege today of uh, inaugurating our uh, Inclusive Capitalism Fireside Chat program uh, with my first guest, uh, someone who I've had the benefit of knowing for some time, John Rogers, who is the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Aerial Investments. John, thank you for your time today. I know you have an incredibly busy schedule, and it's a privilege to have you join us uh, to talk about uh, some of the topics that we'll cover. Well, thank you. This is really an important topic, and so there's no better use of time than to be here today with you. Well, let's get started. Um, the first topic I wanted to cover um, is Chicago itself as a historic portal for wealth creation for the African-American community and, and aligning with the, um, the upcoming Black History Month. Uh, you have an incredibly unique vantage point uh, from uh, your time growing up in Chicago to that whole landscape. And I was wondering if you would share uh, some of that with us uh, today. Well, thank you. As, as you know, Chicago used to be the mecca for black businesses throughout the United States. There was, it was not even a close call. You know, we had Johnson Publishing with Ebony and Jed, and John Johnson was the first African-American to make uh, the Forbes list of the 400 wealthiest Americans. George Johnson created Johnson Products with Afro Sheen and Ultra Sheen. It was, a, it was the largest, one of the largest black businesses in the country, but also the first to be listed on a major stock exchange. Uh, two extraordinary businesses. Both had over 500 employees and uh, was making a difference in so many, so many ways. And then we had many other businesses, you know, the insurance companies and banks and uh, Burrell Advertising. And you go down the list, uh, Johnson Cadillac, all these businesses that were growing and thriving, employing people, creating enormous philanthropy for our community, a political empowerment for our community. I had a lunch recently with George Johnson. And, uh, he's roughly 95 years old. And, you know, he reminded me how he helped start Soul Train uh, with Don Cornelius. And he talked about the fact that he was so instrumental in helping Reverend Jackson find a place to live when he moved to Chicago and supporting Dr. King at the height of the Civil Rights Movement and um, just being so engaged in supporting other black businesses. He prepaid three years of advertising in Essence Magazine when they were struggling years and years ago. So we had these iconic figures in our, in our Chicago business community that were well-respected locally as well as nationally and around the world, but we've lost it all. You know, today, when you look at the Cranes list of top 150 companies privately held, there are zero African-American companies that make that list. You know, we used to have more than three, you know, 20 years ago. Now they're all, all gone. So it's a heartbreaking scenario. As you know, we've lost the Johnson Publishing biz building which used to be that iconic building on South Michigan Avenue that was there to inspire entrepreneurs from around the world that they could do it too, like John Johnson had. But literally, Blair, it's all gone. And it's just heartbreaking here in my hometown to have to say that. That is painful to hear, um, John. And so I, I guess I have to ask for, for those in the audience who may be uh, younger millennials or a part of Generation Z and are not as familiar with the history, what what happened? What what's the catalyst that s started to cause the slide in you know what is was outside success for Chicago uh, business owners and entrepreneurs? And now uh, we're we're looking at a, a pretty bleak landscape at this point. It's interesting if you think about it a generation ago. Uh, these wonderful businesses that were of scale and of size. Part of what helped them to grow so substantially is you had political empowerment and community leadership that was fighting for economic justice in our country. You know, you had Maynard Jackson in Atlanta fighting for black businesses. You had Coleman Young in Detroit. You had Marion Barry in Washington, D.C., of course, Harold Washington here in Chicago, fighting for economic justice. You know, Reverend Jackson was at the height of his power you know, threatening boycotts to those corporations that were not working with black companies. He was putting pickets in front of Walgreens and many, many other places, forcing them to do the right thing and do business with black folks. Now you look ahead, you know, 40 years later, 
you know, and I understand that, um, that I guess I really don't understand it, actually, I have to say. Because now our, you know, as we've, as our, some of our civil rights uh, leaders have passed on, um, have grown older, you know, we, we've lost that power and that energy to a large degree. You know, Reverend Sharpton is still making a difference, as you know. Reverend Jackson is still making a difference. But, you know, again, 40 years ago, it was a different story. You know, there was so much power there. And then when you look at our, you know, just like New York City, Chicago went through a whole generation without a black mayor. And many, many cities lost their black mayors. And even when we elected a black mayor from time to time, some places, maybe that new leader didn't have that energy around the importance of black business and the jobs and philanthropy that came from black business that our prior generation of elected leaders. And I'm not exactly sure why that's happened. I understand all these other issues are important, you know, and we need all the issues that are social justice reform and we need uh, voting rights and, and we need better health care. We need better public schools. We need less crime in our streets. We need a better climate. We need all those things. But if we don't have strong economic base in our community, you know, we're not, we aren't going to have anything. Because when you think about it, our poor educations, our poor health care, our, our, our poor results in political races often are tied directly to the lack of wealth in our communities and the lack of jobs in our communities and the lack of equal economic opportunities that are still pervasive in this country that, of course, go back to our historic nature of how we came to this country as slaves and the challenges of Jim Crow and the racism that we've all faced for generations. So we've got to find a way to bring back that energy that we had that fought for economic fairness. I think that made a difference in keeping these businesses growing and thriving. And unfortunately, we've lost so much of it. One of the aspects of the work that you do, John, that I've always admired is that you bring a certain vigor to the conversation when we talk about um, issues around diversity, equity, inclusion, board diversity. Um, what, what, is, what, it, what is it about you that enables you to bring that vigor? Because the dialogue, when I hear others discuss it, they don't discuss it with the same degree of passion. It's, uh, sometimes it sounds more like a nice to do than a need to do. But what, what aspect of your experience helps you to, to bring that vigor to the discussion? You know, I think there'd probably be two broad themes that have really helped me a lot in being willingness to fight so hard for economic justice. I have to start one in my family. You know, I, my great grandfather, J.B. Stratford, owned the Stratford Hotel that was destroyed during the Tulsa race riots a little over 100 years ago. But when you read the stories about J.B. Stratford, he was not only had the largest black hotel in the country, but he was doing business with other black businesses in Tulsa. He was fighting the Jim Crow laws, speaking out for economic justice and fairness, and he was known for his uh, courage. And so it shouldn't have been a surprise that you know his son uh, became a historic leader, actually helping to argue a case in the Supreme Court against restrictive covenants. Uh, his name was C.F. Stratford. Uh, J.B.'s uh, granddaughter, my mother, Jewel Lafontan, was the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Chicago Law School in 1946. She had her own law firm and did many pioneering things. And she talked to me about the challenges that she faced as an African-American woman trying to build a legal career and all the sexism and racism that she faced. And then finally, my dad was a Tuskegee Airman. He was an original uh, Tuskegee Airman and flew over 100 missions in World War II. And we all know how the challenges that they faced trying to fully participate uh, during that great war. So I think when I look at the legacy of having these parents who fought against so much of the racism and discrimination, and I saw how hard it was for them to really break free and get treated fairly in our society, and I heard them speak so much about it, I felt I had to live their values, and I sometimes feel like I'm speaking for them uh, when I'm in these boardrooms. And that brings me to my second point, because I've been so lucky to be in some extraordinary boardrooms, from Bank One to Aon to corporations like now Nike and McDonald's and uh, the New York Times, I realized over these sort of 30 years of board service, the economic opportunities were just not coming our way. You'd sit in a boardroom when there was a transaction being done, and you'd see the white lawyers and investment bankers and consultants and public relations firms and government affairs walk in, and they were all white males. And, you know, I couldn't help but be inspired by someone like Congressman John Lewis, who said, you know, when you see something that's not right, that's not just, you have a moral responsibility to 
point it out and fight for fairness. And then my dad always taught me about the importance of living up to, to the commitments that you make to others. All these institutions on these boards that I'm on have a commitment to working with minority businesses. They have a commitment to DNI, but I saw they weren't literally living those values more often than not. And so holding them accountable to what they promised to our community is part of my responsibility that I think I have to do the right thing. And again, echo the words of John Lewis and try to make good trouble whenever possible. There are a lot of my peers who fail to make the connection with board diversity and how that affects the folks who are sitting around the kitchen table trying to pay their bills, trying to decide what bill to pay, how they're going to better educate their kids. Um, can you take a minute to just walk through, very, it could be very anecdotally, just the understanding of why board diversity matters. Why do we need more representation on some of these Fortune 500 companies and publicly traded companies and, and other institutions that, that pull the levers of power economically in this country? Well, as, as you know, Blair, boards uh, oversee the anchor institutions in our community, whether it's a hospital, a university, a museum, or a Fortune 500 company. They hire and fire the CEO and then set the standards of whether that CEO is going to be held accountable for the diversity of their team and the diversity throughout the organization, the diversity of their spend with minority-owned businesses, um, the diversity of their philanthropy. Is it hitting the kind of institutions that we care about, our civil rights organizations and progressive institutions? So the boards have oversight over all of that and can hold those companies, those institutions accountable to live those values. So boards are very powerful. I was fortunate to see that power through my mom's uh, pioneering corporate board work. And um, it's really critical. But what we've tried to do with the conference that we started almost 20 years ago with Charles Tribbett at Russell Reynolds, we call it our Black Corporate Directors Conference. We bring black directors together. But the idea is not only to get more of us on corporate boards, which is something we believe in. And I can point to, as a professional investor, we've been able to convince more than 50 companies to have their first African-American board member, uh, from Sotheby's uh, with Don Stewart to JLL with Marty Nesbitt, but 50 different institutions we've been able to do that. So we believe deeply in that. But what I've talked to Reverend Jackson and Reverend Sharpton about is not just getting more of us in the boardroom, but we need to have people who are going to come into that boardroom and have the courage to speak out and fight for fairness once they're in the boardroom. The hypothesis when we started the conference is too many of us are happy to be there, are uncomfortable making waves, don't want to get tossed out of the boardroom. And so they don't, you know, come out and, and, and point out the unfairness and things that are not right. So every year at our conference, now our conference has grown from 30 black directors 18 years ago or so to now over 200 directors. On Friday night, we have what we call the conscience of the conference. And it's often people who march with Dr. King, like Harry Belafonte or Reverend Jackson or Andy Young or John Lewis, people like that, that can remind directors of this responsibility that we have to speak out and fight for fairness. You know, it's just morally wrong for these doors to be opened up by these pioneers who sacrificed everything to open up these doors for us. And then we're going to sit there and collect the checks, make the white folks comfortable. That's just not acceptable. And it's just morally wrong. So I think that's why we have to try to put pressure to not only have more of us in the boardroom, but make sure we put the right people in the boardroom that can make a difference for our community. So, John, uh, you not only talk about the racial wealth gap, um, you're making an effort to do something about it. There's been dialogue for years and a long list of studies uh, that we could discuss um, about the racial wealth gap in this country. Uh, particularly for African Americans, but you're you're putting your words into meaningful action. And about a year ago, I think you launched uh, an initiative to help address it through aerial investments. Can you talk a little bit about that and and uh, any uh, updates uh, since that launch? Sure. Well, specifically to your question, the most recent initiative is uh, what we call Project Black that Melody Hobson, my co-CEO at Ariel, uh, created. Um, and we are building out a private equity fund that will invest in black businesses of scale. 
and uh, we really want to bring back the, the magic that we talked about earlier when we had these large, large, uh, major businesses here in Chicago. We want to be able to replicate that around the nation. And so we're off to a great start. We're out there working hard at it, and Melody's put together a great team of people. We have a, a, a chairman and CEO of Project Black, Les Brune, who is an extraordinary leader and, and business talent and uh, former board member of Merck and uh, uh, founder of Hamilton Lane Investments, uh, just a real superstar. So we really are excited about that. It sort of models a little bit about what McDonald's has done so well over generations of building large, large companies uh, that are black owned. You know, if you look at the black enterprise list of top 100 companies, a disproportionate amount of the top 20 companies are actually McDonald's suppliers. And it's because they've known how to do that very, very, very well. But the other thing we've been trying to do across black wealth that goes back even longer Beside won the Black Corporate Directors Conference that we thought would help create black wealth by inspiring black directors to fight for economic justice in the boardroom. But the other thing that we started 25 years ago when uh, Arnie Duncan, the former Secretary of Education, was working here at Ariel, we created a small public school where we uh, teach the kids at our public school about the stock market and give kids real dollars to invest in real stocks and get them that exposure that's so important. And more and more of those young kids, once they get exposed to our analysts and they come down here to the office and we go down to the aerial school, these black kids come out inspired to think about financial services careers, which we think will ultimately make a dent in this wealth gap that we have in our country. And then finally, we created a program at the University of Chicago for minority students to get paid internships to work in the investment offices of major endowments. You know, most major endowments, it's like baseball in 1940. Um, basically very, very little diversity at all. And those are places where a lot of wealth is created, not only the folks who work in the endowment, but of course all the money managers that work for those endowments make lots and lots of money, and we've been left out of that ecosystem. So we really hope that this latest project, we've had over 100 diverse students go through the program, getting a chance to work at some of the largest endowments in the nation, and we hope that that's going to make a difference. Uh, Ten years from now, you'll see some of these young people uh, really thriving in a part of the economy that maybe they had never thought about because they had never been exposed to it. Well, John, that's, that's excellent work. And congratulations to you and Melody for, um, for initiating that and continuing that. Um, you know, a key term that everyone is talking about now uh, as we look ahead at the market cycle is sustainability. And you know, what sort of coaching or advice would you give to uh, those young folks, those folks who are part of Generation Z that that aspire to 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 be where you are, to get to get to that place um, that you've held for so long? I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't congratulate you on uh, making uh, Cranes Chicago uh, top 25 again. Uh, I think you've ascended higher on the list. Uh, I think maybe the governor is ahead of you and maybe one other, two other people, but that's, that's, that's quite an accolade and, and congratulations on that achievement. Um, there are young folks who are watching this and listening to this. Uh, maybe they w are thinking about uh, launching a firm or maybe they're thinking about uh, they're sitting at Howard or at Hampton or uh, North Carolina A&T and they think, I want to get into the asset management game, what, what sort of advice or coaching um, would you give them um, if, if they're looking at or thinking about that type of career? Okay, well, yeah, well there's a lot there in the, in the question. A couple thoughts. One, I was just going to say thank you for mentioning the Cranes list. You know, I've been joking with Melody that I, I'm, I'm three spots behind her in the list, and so uh, <laughs> I've got to try to catch her. But it's kind of cool, though, that a little black company in Chicago would have two of the uh, top 25 uh, powerful leaders, uh, you know, here in Chicago. So it's kind of a, a remarkable that we've been able to uh, develop the kind of talent that we have here at our small firm and hopefully making a difference for our community each and every day. You know, Melody is a powerhouse and is out there fighting for economic justice also and making sure that women and women of color uh, have the fair opportunities that they deserve. Um, you know, when I think about some of the reasons why we've had some of the success we've had in general, it kind of comes from what my basketball coach taught me playing basketball at Princeton. You know, he said, you always think about your teammates first. You know, always look out for others first. And if you do that, the team wins and good things come back to you. And so I've learned that whatever I try to do and get involved, that I want to be a good teammate. 
you know, you know, if I'm helping Reverend Sharpton or Reverend Jackson or I'm helping President Obama run for president or I'm working for uh, Princeton, I'm going to try to be the ultimate teammate. And I think when you really think about others first and how to succeed, ultimately influence and opportunity come your way because people want to have those that are trying to help the team win kind of in the rooms where things happen. When it comes to the part of your question around specifically the asset management industry, I'd go back to what we were doing at the University of Chicago. I tell young people of color all the time, whether you're at Howard or you're at uh, Spelman or you're at a, a white institution, make sure that you have one of your summer internships in the endowment office. Because people don't think about the fact that places like Harvard have over $50 billion in their endowments. You know, many of the uh, large institutions, large, uh, uh, historically black colleges have large, large, significant endowments now that are growing quite rapidly after the George Floyd murder. And so you can learn every aspect of the investment world working in an endowment office. You'll learn about hedge funds, you'll learn about private equity, you'll learn about venture capital, and you'll be helping your alma mater to be more successful and, and to be able to grow the wealth of the institution that you most likely love and care about. So it's one of those kind of a person who has a conscience and someone who cares broadly about the environment and the community. If you're working in an endowment office, you can achieve those goals, at the same time learn about financial services, and then decide as time goes on, do you want to create a career path and be like Kim Liu, who's the CIO of the Columbia University and get paid really well to do that and make a difference? Or maybe you'll get pulled out of there and go to a hedge fund or a private equity firm or a venture capital firm and follow in the footsteps of people like Marty Nesbitt and others who've done so well in that field. So um, I think getting started early is important. And then working in that endowment office as an intern, I think it's the best way to learn. And then finally, try to find some dollars to get involved in the market directly yourself. Because I think when people are interviewing you, they like to see that you've been able to uh, put your money where your mouth is and really experience investing firsthand with real money. I'm always amazed at the depth of knowledge that uh, so many young people have around capital markets. And it seems like with technology, they've had far more uh, exposure to it than uh, perhaps I did uh, when I was growing up. Um, one last question to ask you, you referenced the uh, George Floyd uh, tragedy. And uh, there's been a strange, uh, I guess you'd call it benefit, this window of opportunity that, that we've discussed and, and others um, in your peer group have discussed that have created um, opportunities and, and dialogue and discussion that just hadn't occurred um, for many, many years for African Americans. Um, and so I always ask, uh, do you feel like this, this window of opportunity is sustaining itself or is it beginning to close? I'm optimistic. You know, uh, I think that it's, 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 it's going to be sustainable. Here in Chicago, our civic committee, our largest uh, business organization, is committed uh, to working with black businesses across the board in everything we do, not just the traditional contracting things, but to think about using minority financial services firms or professional services firms uh, or technology firms. They've embraced the term that the University of Chicago uh, thought of, which is called business diversity, replacing the old fashioned term supplier diversity to include us again in the parts of the economy where the real wealth and jobs are being created today. We, you, know, you know from New York how much wealth is created on Wall Street. You know now how much wealth is created in Silicon Valley through tech. And the idea that I would call it a modern day Jim Crow, that we only get to do the catering, the construction, and, and the white men get to do all the wealth building parts of the spend. So I think that is uh, starting to happen. And I'm seeing more and more of it. Uh, we're getting asked, for example, at Ariel to have our mutual funds added to more and more 401k plans, which is easy to do. That never happened before. Uh, Melody and I are getting constant calls about ideas for who can be added to a board uh, from a diversity standpoint to learn about how we've been able to build a culture of inclusiveness here at Ariel. Those calls keep coming and speaking opportunities to go out and talk about these things. So this time it seems real. It seems sustainable. Okay, I'm feeling very optimistic in the last couple of years that there is some positivity coming from this extraordinary, tragic period in our country's history. Well, John, that's good to hear. I love to hear that, that optimism coming from you here at the Milken Institute within the Center of Financial Markets. We're going to do our part to try to 
keep that window of sustainability open through our inclusive capitalism program. But I wanted to thank you again for your time uh, this afternoon and sharing your wisdom. John Rogers, chairman and CEO of Aerial Investments, uh, we appreciate uh, your time and all that you do. Well, thank you.